everyone, welcome back. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about the what is really the heart of my uh, 10 gigahertz receiving system, and that's these uh, LNBs. Uh, you may be familiar with these from uh, satellite TV dishes, although the ones on most of those may look a little bit different than this. Uh, but basically it's a dish feed horn uh, with uh, internal uh, LNAs, low noise amplifiers, or what we in ham radio might call preamps or preamplifiers, and then a block down converter uh, that converts the uh, uh, 10 to 12 gigahertz range uh, somewhere up in there down to, to UHF uh, 600 to 2100 megahertz or something like that. I probably don't have the exact frequency ranges uh, correct, but because I'm going from memory. But they'll take a signal on uh, 10.368 gigahertz and convert it down to 618 megahertz where it's easily received by a lot of uh, uh, software-defined receivers. <clears throat> so they're really convenient for us uh, working at uh, 10 gigs for a receive-only system. Now I like these particular ones. This is called a Bullseye 10 kilohertz uh, LNB or model BE01. Um, and the thing about these is um, First of all, they're more frequency stable than most LNBs, and they're not perfect. They do drift, uh, you know, they may have some frequency error. Uh, uh, one of these that I was using without modifying it had an error of about 25 kilohertz. Some of them are a lot less. Uh, and they also have some thermal drift. They'll move around a couple kilohertz or three or four or five kilohertz with uh, thermal changes. You can still hear a lot on 10 gigs with these. If you're lucky, you can even decode... Uh, weak digital signals like EME without any modification some of the time, but it won't work all of the time. So um, I've been modifying these and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the modification is and uh, how it's done and some of the pitfalls I get into. So I like these particular ones because out of the box without the modification they are more frequency stable and you can use them that way. Um, they're also great for the modification in that they're really, um, there's not a lot you have to do to them, although it is a little tricky. Uh, so they have two connectors on them, and the purpose of these connectors, the green color coded one is the DC power input, and it takes 12 volts at about 75 milliamps or so for vertical polarization, and around 16 volts at 75 milliamps or so for, uh, for uh, horizontal polarization. And this is also the IF output. This is where the 618 megahertz comes out and down the coax um, to your SDR receiver. They also have the red connector, and uh, in a stock unit, this is connected up to the output of the internal 25 megahertz uh, oscillator in these for purposes of either going to a frequency counter to check what the actual frequency of the oscillator is or to some kind of frequency compensation circuit that then feeds back a... Uh, a serial signal into here somehow, I guess, and controls the uh, internal microcontroller and, and you can trim the frequency on these. That's a little too complicated. I'm not going to try to get into doing anything like that. But if you remove the internal uh, little oscillator, which is the modification I've been making, then without any other changes you can use this red connector to feed in a 25 megahertz signal from an external source, like a uh, GPSDO, a GPS uh, disciplined oscillator, which will take all the drift out of these because a GPSDO is uh, extremely stable. So I really like these uh, these bullseye LNBs. Also, they work very well at 10 uh, 10.368 gig uh, receive and 618 megahertz output. Uh, seem to have a pretty low noise figure. They receive EME signals well, and the uh, you know, they perform pretty well. Better than some other LNBs that I've uh, played with or uh, read about. So, uh, I'll show you a little bit about how I get one of these open and the modification. Uh, part of this will be video and part of this will be steer still images and I'll do a, uh, a voiceover uh, rather than recording a, a really lengthy uh, and uh, large file video. And I'll talk about some of the pitfalls I've had with these and uh, what I've been able to do to recover them after I got into a little bit of trouble with the uh, modification. So uh, that's the subject of uh, today's video. Hope you enjoy and maybe find something uh, useful here if you're planning to uh, do some of these modifications yourself. So the first thing you need to know about these LNBs if you're going to modify one is how to get it open. 
Uh, there's two halves to this plastic case with a seam that uh, goes around here, and there's uh, six plastic clips, three on each side. One is uh, right in here, right adjacent to the uh, connectors, and then the other two are up along this uh, 40 millimeter uh, diameter neck portion in here. What I have found to get these open is uh, sometimes just by pressing down really firmly, very, very firmly on this part of the case opposite the uh, the part of the case that's opposite where the connectors protrude here, and then wedging a thumbnail into the uh, crack in the case. Sometimes I can pop them open without anything else. Uh, this one's already been open, and I think I can pop it open that way right there. If not, then I can reach down inside of here beside the uh, the connector with a little screwdriver and get behind the, the little clip and kind of pry it open gently a little bit while I'm also pushing down out here and uh, prying there with a fingernail to get the case popped open. So by one of those two methods, uh, whatever works, and uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm pressing down with my index finger here really hard, pressing my thumbnail into it, and yeah, this one just popped. I've now got my thumbnail right in the, uh, in the uh, seam around the case there. So I'm going to take a little small uh, screwdriver and just poke it in where my thumbnail is just to wedge that open on that side right there. I'm going to flip it over to the other side and try to do the same thing over here. Push down really firmly and see if I can pop this case without having to uh, resort to prying inside. And yeah, I got this one too. So then I'll wedge a, uh, another little screwdriver in over on this side to keep that open. And then usually uh, well, every every time so far, I've been able to squeeze these cases up here on the 40 millimeter neck portion really, really tight, and pop all the uh, pop all the clips out. And they've come out on this one side, uh, and they haven't really come out on the other side yet. So I got to keep this open while I flip it over. And there they go. There they go on the other side. And once you do that, you can just uh, hinge open these two uh, case halves and pop them out from under the. Uh, rim of the uh, red plastic cap there, and there you go. And so far, I have not broken a single one of these six uh, plastic clips. So this particular LNB has been apart now three or four times, uh, and I've taken several of these units apart, and I've not broken a single one of these uh, plastic clips around here yet uh, doing that, which uh, really surprises me. Um, other LNBs that I've taken apart, the plastic clips are pretty much all uh, all destroyed in the process. So these uh, these uh, particular LNBs seem fairly robust and they do come apart without uh, destruction, at least uh, so far they have for me. It took me a little while to learn how to do it on the first one. It does take some patience and every time I do a new one that hasn't been apart before it usually takes me four or five minutes to get those first couple of clips open, the ones in the, in the back there near the connectors, and then the rest of it from there is usually uh, a lot easier. So uh, once you get inside you're going to be confronted with uh, this cover which will have white goo sealing all the way around it and sealing over these uh, five screw heads. You need to get that off and then uh, I do some work inside. So from this point on, um, since I don't have an unmodified unit right here to show you all of this, I'm going to uh, put some still images in the video and do a voiceover talking about uh, what some of that process is. Um, I will uh, because it's hard be hard to show this in the voiceover. Uh, part of what I do on these um, to open them up is I pick the uh, the white goo that's filling these uh, Torx head screws. I pick it out of the uh, actual Torx head part of the screw. Where I'm going to have to get a screwdriver in there or a Torx bit in there to uh, to get it out. I just pick it off of there, and I don't really pick it off the rest of the screws. I just take a uh, an X-Acto knife with a uh, pointed uh, number 11 blade like this. This blade's broken a little bit, but normally they're very very pointy. And just run it like right around the screw head to break the uh, seal, right around the outside of the screw head. And then I run it vertically down in, in the gap between, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of a gap between the uh, cover and the uh, like rim on the other part of the case. That's all sealed with white goo and I just stick the uh, knife down in there vertically and go work my way all the way around the uh, case just to break that, uh, break that seal and leave as much of that uh, goo intact. I really don't remove any of it at all uh, other than from in the uh, screw heads. Leave it as much of it intact as possible and then once that's all cut off I take another one of these little screwdrivers just pop it right down in he here on the end uh, opposite the connectors dig under the edge of there a little bit and pry and that cover will pretty easily pop right off at that point. It, it doesn't take too much to get them off once you've uh, broken the seal around there. 
All right, so from that, I'll go with a series of still images and uh, do a voiceover and talk some more about the uh, modification and some uh, pitfalls and some repairs if you do get into some of the issues that I've had with uh, with things not going quite the way you wanted with the uh, modification. Okay, so once you pop the cover off, here's what you're going to find. Uh, once you pop the plastic case off, I mean, here's what you're going to find for the internal uh, metal cover. You see it's all sealed with goo around the edge and over the uh, screws. So that's what I was describing before about uh, picking it off the screws and cutting it around the edge. And uh, please don't forget to remove the screws before you try to pry the cover off. I did forget to say that before, but... Uh, Please remove the uh, screws. That'll make uh, prying the cover off a whole lot uh, easier, or at least uh, possible. So in this next image, uh, the little uh, metal uh, rectangular can there, circled in yellow, is the part you want to remove. That's the internal oscillator. It's a TCXO or VCXO, whatever it is, but it's a little... 25 megahertz oscillator and the only modification you need to make to these is to remove that one unit. Now there is also uh, another possible way to do this that's been suggested and I have not tried it yet is to cut a trace that runs, I don't think you can even see it here, but there's a little uh, tiny circuit trace that runs out from under that device uh, up near the upper right corner and goes under the uh, little black uh, uh, 3.3 volt regulator uh, right to the right of it there. You, you might be able to get a knife blade down in between there and cut that trace instead of uh, removing this thing. So if you want to try that, go ahead. I have not yet done that. Uh, so here's how I've uh, removed them. Um, I've used this um, little inexpensive uh, hot air soldering and rework uh, station with about a quarter inch diameter uh, a nozzle on the end of it to uh, heat that part up and then use uh, you know until the solder flows and then use tweezers to pull it off. Uh, easier said than done a lot of the heat goes right through the uh, PC board if you leave it in the uh, metal case and into the metal and it really heat sinks it and it's hard to get that thing off. On the uh, first one I did I uh, had trouble uh, getting it off, and so finally I removed the uh, PC board from the uh, metal case, and that made it much easier to get this thing off, but there was a side effect to that. In order to remove the PC board, there's these two center pins from the two F connectors, one of them shown here at the end of the uh, little red uh, tuning tool there. You have to unsolder those from the board. They're the only thing holding it in. It's just those two uh, center pins of the connectors. So unsolder those, lift the board out, take the, uh, the oscillator module off, put the board back in, and re-solder these pins to the board. But this is a little tricky. Unless you hold the board down really, really tight against the metal case when you solder these, you might have trouble because when you put the cover back on, it's going to press down hard on this circuit board. So if it was, if it was lifted up even a tiny bit when you soldered these, then um, when you put the cover back on, it's going to push the circuit board down and, and tend to break the, uh, pull the uh, little uh, half circular pad on the board right off because the solder is up on the pin and you're pushing the board like away from your uh, solder that you added here. And that's what happened to this one. This is a damaged uh, LNB, the first one I modified. And you can't see here in the still image, but that's broken right off the board. You can kind of see the white half circle there where it's on the board where this uh, used this pad used to be stuck to the board and now it's ripped right off and so it's also ripped off the circuit trace that connected it to that tiny little component uh, just to the upper left of where that center pin is tiny little resistor capacitor whatever that is probably a capacitor so um I had later repaired that one by uh, creating a solder bridge from the center pin over to that little device uh, up at the uh, upper left and for now it's uh, holding and uh, and working but uh, we'll see how long now the next one i of these i modified i got stubborn and decided to leave the pc board in because i didn't have a uh, didn't want to have a repeat of that issue so i just kept heating this thing and cranking up the uh, hot air uh airflow until i finally got the tcxo off but by the time it came off several components around it had also uh 
uh, come loose and blown around in the hot air, and they were located elsewhere on the uh, circuit board. Here's just one of them shown here, circled in yellow. There's a little capacitor that's not where it belongs. It has slid, uh, turned around 90 degrees and slid over and kind of uh, stuck itself to this other big uh, capacitor just to its right. So not where it belongs. So I had to heat this up with a soldering iron and pluck it off with tweezers and uh, save it. Here's some other parts that I also found in different areas of the circuit board that had come off and moved. Two little tiny ones there. I think one of them is a resistor and the other may be a capacitor. I'm not sure. But these things are really small. These tweezers are sharp as a needle. They're, they're just like needles. They're that small. And so you can imagine how, how small these two... Uh, little uh, black looking SMD devices are there. And then the larger one with the, uh, with the uh, five pins, you could just, you could see two of them on the uh, lower right and just barely make out that there are three on the uh, upper left side of it. That device is the 3.3 volt regulator. It's that little black device I showed you just to the right of the uh, oscillator module. So these had all come off and I had to locate them and, and then try to get them uh, back onto the circuit board, which in the end I was uh, successful in doing. And I don't know how. I had never worked with anything anywhere near this small before. I'm really surprised I was able to get them back on there successfully, uh, but I did. And so here's an image uh, with all of those parts replaced. And the parts circled in yellow are, have been uh, repopulated, put back onto the board where they belong. There's that... Um, there's that uh, five terminal little 3.3 volt regulator marked 93S2H. That's been put back on. Up to the uh, upper left of that a little bit, there's that little uh, sort of brownish looking capacitor up in there that's been put back. There's a big brown capacitor just below the, I think it's a capacitor, just below the 3.3 uh, volt regulator. And then to the uh, down and to the left of that, there's a little tiny uh, black device, which I think is a resistor, uh, that's also been put back onto the board. So uh, somehow, uh, using a soldering iron, I was, and tweezers, you know, hold them on there with tweezers, heat one end with a soldering iron and, uh, until it sticks down, and go to the other end, heat it up with a soldering iron, flow a tiny bit of very small diameter solder in there. And then I went back to the first end and kind of just uh, stuck the soldering iron there, on there and reflowed a tiny bit of solder in there. Again, new solder with flux, of course, to you know, to do a good job of this. And uh, and I did get them back on there. Now there's some excess solder you can kind of see, especially on that brown one just below the 3.3 uh, volt regulator. You can see a little point of solder sticking up on it. This is all in the 3.3 volt and 25 megahertz area. And so I don't think these are super critical. Uh, this one works after repair. So I don't think it's a problem that there's a little bit of extra solder on these. And I made no attempt to clean it off because I didn't want to risk heating these up so much that the uh, components fell off the board again. So uh, this is a successful repair. This is the one I have up on the tower now and it is working. So um, it is possible if you run into problems uh, getting that uh, oscillator module off because of the case heat sinking it or, or whatever that you can uh, repair these units and, and still use them. Uh, I've got both of the ones that I uh, that I damaged, uh, you know, in uh, well, one, I damaged the uh, PC board by uh, not having it down tight enough when I resoldered that pin on the connector, and the other, I, I accidentally removed several components from it and had to put them back on. But both of these are repaired. Both of them are working. The second one I showed you with the multiple components I put back is the one up on the tower, and it's working great. So at least um, I found, for me, it was possible to get out of trouble uh, after getting into it on these. So those are my comments on LNB modification and uh, the oops repair after uh, modification didn't go quite the way I uh, had wished it would or planned it to go. So I'm having to do a second uh, voiceover here because I did forget to mention um, the little area circled in red. There's a little uh, piece of, uh, of solder there. A uh, little, I don't know, I, I don't really want to call it a solder blob. It's more like a solder splatter. I don't know where it came from exactly, but a little area circled in red is a little floating piece of uh, solder that uh, I almost didn't notice, and I finally did, and so I picked that off the board with the tweezers. So uh, just beware, you know, to inspect these boards uh, carefully. Uh, 
uh, for other errors, uh, other uh, problems before you um, before you put these things back together. And one final note. I apologize for the quality of these voiceovers on this video and uh, the last one I did that had a voiceover. I haven't yet figured out why this uh, doesn't sound good. Uh, it might be the microphone, but I don't think it is. I've used this microphone for other things uh, uh, that weren't computer related and it worked great. And it should be, it's designed to be a computer microphone. It should be okay. And for some reason it isn't. And I, I, th I have a feeling it's some sort of Windows uh, sound setting, but it really sounds strange. It, it, it's not clipped. It's not overdriven. I don't know. Um, uh, it's almost like it's compressed, but it's uh, 48,000 hertz uh, bandwidth. So I don't, I don't know what's going on with it. I, I'm still digging around trying to figure that out. If anybody, uh, I know some of my viewers uh, have your own uh, YouTube channels and create content. If you've got any ideas, I'm doing this voiceover in HitFilm Express. If you have any idea what setting I should be looking at or how to fix the uh, crappy sounding uh, voiceover audio, uh, let me know. I'm still researching it and uh, trying to figure that one out, but I didn't want to delay these videos for who knows how long while I'm trying to come up with a solution to that. Anyway, uh, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, again, I apologize for the uh, lousy audio. See you next time.